there. Wow, hello Los Angeles. Nice to see you all in my favorite colored seats. All is well. <laughs> Let's give another round of applause for Melissa McCarthy. Uh, thanks. Excellent. So, uh, how many of these talks have you done for this movie? Delightfully, quite a, f uh, quite a few, which is always nice. Oh. Because not, not doing them's not good. That's true. That's true. If it's, no one wants I, to I talk. Would, I, I oh. find it exciting that people want to hear more about the movie and Lee and, and the whole process of our little short 28-day shooting schedule. So. Wow. Yeah. You Doesn't that sound crazy? Days? Did you shoot it in New York? We did. We shot in New York. We shot all on location. Most of, uh, almost all of the bookstores were, were the stores that Lee actually grifted people lovingly. <laughs> I'm I'm, I always have a soft spot for her, so I say lovingly grifted people. Um, yeah, and it was really hard for Mari Heller, our amazing director, even when she was scouting, she said that they were getting calls you know, they were going to all these beautiful bookstores, and I was in the, you know, I moved to New York in 1990 and spent a very strange amount of time in bookstores and never thought about what a, I mean, they're completely vanishing. And she said even during the scouting process, mm -hmm. they kept getting calls, and they were like, you can't use it. No, she's like, why? What can we do? And they're like, we're closing. In three months, we'll be closed. She's like, they were just vanishing in front of them. What's your favorite bookstore in New York City? That's a tricky one. I don't think it's still actually there. I've spent a lot of time in like the East Village. I like the ones that you kind of go down into the recesses and there, when there was a broom, actually one of them that we shot in, the one that my husband uh, was being terrible to me. Um, <laughs> it was at one point we were all, there's 50 people down there shooting and I turned around and I went, oh my God look at what's holding up the ceiling and there's just a broomstick. <laughs> and like the whole ceiling kind of went in and we're like, it'll be fine. Yeah, it's, It has comforting. a sturdy broom holding it up. <laughs> How did this project come to you? I actually, uh, several, many years ago, maybe four-ish, uh, Ben got the movie, my husband who plays one of the book dealers, in it, uh, the, sh the shiftiest of all the book dealers, <laughs> I may say. Um, he got it, and we always read each other's work and then want to talk about it. And I read it immediately, and I came running out. He was outside, and I was like, oh my god, this is so good. It's so good. And he goes, I, I, I know, I, I, I thought you'd like it. And uh, I kind of was just stunned by her, and I was a little disappointed in myself that I didn't know who she was. I thought that was my New York. I was there. And just, she had such a fascinating story. I, I should have known who Lee Israel was. And um, then for, you know, the million reasons films fall apart, the movie didn't work out. And I just kept asking him every, like, started out probably every three weeks and then moved to two. <laughs> and then it was a couple times a week that I was like, what's happening with that movie? Because I, I really want to see that. I want to see her story. And he was like, I don't know. Like, we don't own it. Like, what? I don't know what you want me to tell you. I was like, okay, I'll ask you in like two days and see what's <laughs> happening. And finally, I realized that it had been weeks and I'd kind of fallen in love with Lee. And I, you know, contacted the producers and just said, you know, do I have a, a shot at playing with her? I feel like I have a very strong connection with her and I I remember reading it and about page 20 I thought I like her so much and then I didn't know why <laughs> and I went back and reread the first 20 and I thought nope there's no real reason <laughs> I like her and yet I'm completely drawn to her I'm completely on her side and I thought oh isn't that an interesting person of someone that you root for in spite of themselves, and I, I don't know, I, I was kind of hooked, and I thought the same for Jack. I, I like people that you shouldn't like. I think it's most of our nearest and dearest. We all have friends that you're like, they're great, they're gonna be crazy, but they're great, just trust me. <laughs> How did you prepare for this role, given that there wasn't a lot of information out there about her? Because I, too, encountered Lee for the first time when I watched this movie, and I was like, I want to be her friend. She's terrible. So am I. We can be terrible together. 
<laughs> I, you know, it's hard because when I started trying to research her, true to, I think, who Lee was, she didn't want anybody to know her business. So there's nothing out there. I read her books, and I know that she was a really good writer, but it didn't give me any information on her. And I thought, well, I don't really know how to go about this and be true to her. And then I was lucky enough, two of our producers were very close with her. One knew her for 20 years. And um, it's actually one of the main reasons that she finally wrote her memoir, which she says she was a complete pain in the ass, like Lee always was. She wouldn't just write it. And they went ba back and forth forever. And then finally he was just like, just write the damn book, Lee. Mm -hmm. And everything was kind of this struggle. But then it would end funny. And then Ann Carey, another producer, is the one who finally talked her into letting her memoir become a movie. This was 10 years ago. She's been with this project for 10 years. And she, every story about Lee, I would just sit and have them talk to me about her. And every single story always was something like, Anne would always take her to dinner. She'd always get there. Lee was always there ahead of time, drink in hand. <laughs> and then when she left, dinner was up, and then Lee was up and out the door, like immediately. And then Anne would get the bill <laughs> and always realize her consistent pattern. Lee had gotten there about a half hour early, had two or three drinks, had dinner, and then was up and out and left Anne with the bill. But I was like, I guess you shouldn't, but it still made me laugh. Like I always kind of thought, <laughs> I, and I was at Julius's back in the 90s, and I always wonder, like, was I standing next to her at the bar just talking like a mile a minute? And did she, was she like, is this girl ever going to shut up? But I wish to God I would have met her. I think it would have been incredible just to have her say some vicious, terrible thing, and then I would just hold it in my soul for a very long time. And just feel really good about it. <laughs> well, Jay, when we were, sh the scene with Jane Curtin in her, when she's having the book party, uh, that was Jane's first day. And she came in and she said, you know, I, I didn't put it together until like a, a couple days ago. She said 20 some years ago, her and her husband were at a book party in New York. And she said, you know, everybody's standing around. It's perfectly fine. And she said, someone came in and it was just like this, weird, disruptive, not particularly loud, but just like grumbling and moving through and getting a bunch of food and like pounding two drinks and just pushing through. She said it was just kind of like, oh God, who? and it kind of moved through this party and then out the door. And she said it was Lee. And she said when she left, she said, "What? who the hell was that? And someone said, it's Lee Israel. And she, she was like, and we're literally doing almost this scene, and it's 20, 25 years later. Oh, the circle of life, man. Yeah. It just <laughs> comes around Crazy. and around. You know, oftentimes when women are opinionated or when they use profanity or when they're unpleasant, they're called difficult. Uh, did you consider Lee a difficult woman? Yes, delightfully. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I wear difficulty uh, like a proud cape. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's such a negative thing. I don't know where that came from. There's so many questions about, were you concerned about playing someone difficult or unlikable? I was like, I liked her very much. I don't mm -hmm. know. I don't know how to play pleasant. I don't, I'm not skilled enough. I don't know what that means. I certainly don't know anyone perfect. I'm not perfect by a long shot. And I don't know what I'd kind of sink my teeth into. I think so many roles have been like, perfect hair, perfect outfit, perfect job, perfect line. You never say anything wrong. I was like, I don't know that robot. It's certainly not any of my friends or family that I love to the end of the earth. I love the flaws and eccentricities and weirdness of people. I, I don't have any friends that probably aren't peculiar or set in their own ways. I think we all are. So I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't kind of understand that whole way of thinking of like difficult. I was like, who is your mom or sister <laughs> or aunt? Because I'd like to watch you tell them that they're difficult or wrong. When you say you wear difficulty like a cape, how does that manifest itself in your life? Tell us more about being difficult. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I just probably have never gone along. Uh, not in a combative way, more of just, I probably as a kid was just always like, I don't think so. 
<laughs> Someone's like, you can't do this, or you can't do that, or you shouldn't do this. I was like, I don't think that's right. I don't know, maybe it's complete, um, I don't know, I don't know what, it's complete lack of something, but <laughs> I, I think I've just never gone along uh, without so much of a fight. I just thought, you know, I've been told everything. You'll never work, you won't do this, you can't play a neighbor, my favorite. Uh, <laughs> truly, I wish I remembered who said that. They're like, she's just not a neighbor type. We don't buy that she could be a neighbor. I was like, I can't wait to tell all of my neighbors. <laughs> and what kind of weird, like, sea creature am I that I can't play a neighbor? <laughs> I am a neighbor on multiple sides. Um, but I think I've just, I don't know. I grew up on a farm and I'm like was by myself a lot in barns. And I think I just made up a lot of stuff. So when people said like, you can or can't do something, I don't know if I had a worldly enough point of view to believe it. Instead, I was just like, nah, I think you can. Mm -hmm. so. Do you find that that serves you well now, given that you're often told you can't do this, you can't do that? Yeah, I still don't buy it. And I realize there's something that's like, you're not the best choice. I may not be someone's pick. I get all that, but like, can't. I don't love the word can't. Mm -hmm. I always think that's like kind of a crazy, you can't until you do it. And then someone's like, you did it. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Because if you just, I'm a, I'm a worker bee. I'm a, I need to be in motion. I need to do. So I'm always like, well, at least give me the chance to go through the motions. Like, you may not like what I do, but I can do it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to like it, but don't don't tell me I, I can't do it. So you don't want to hear can't ever? Well, <laughs> I heard a lot from my kids. Uh, but that's, that's different. And then I just said, yes, you can. <laughs> now go pick it up. So you do a lot of comedy, and things have been, I don't know, fairly grim this year in the world. So how do you still find the energy to do comedy when the world doesn't feel like it has space for fun? I kind of think, you, I think you need it more. I need it more now than ever. I think no matter how kind of hate-filled and, and negative things get, I still think, well, I have so many things I love and I, I know so many amazing people that do wonderful things and help people in, in little ways and big ways. And I have two girls and I, I just can't think that the world isn't hopeful. I think there's an ebb and flow and I, I just don't think people can across the board just hate everyone else because it's, I mean, it's like the, the purge or something, like something that's <laughs> crazy. We just can't, like, we're not all trying to murder each other or like hate each other. It's like, I just, I have to keep telling myself, I don't feel like it's the majority. And I do think that you can't preach at people, you can't always change their mind. I mean, people, someone who has a very different opinion of me is not gonna change my mind tonight because they say something. But I can watch something that kind of pokes fun at me. All right, I, I hope and think that you can kind of hold a mirror up and, and shine the light and make everybody go like, well, maybe that's a little bit all of us, like not just me, but that guy, not just him or her, a little bit me too, and it kind of takes the edge off. And I, I think, I think we're in trouble if we stop kind of putting the putting the value on comedy. Mm -hmm. So, what makes you laugh in when you're reading a script, when you're watching television on your own, or movies? Uh, so many things. My husband makes me laugh a lot because he's, you know, there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of, I mean this in a good way, there's not a lot of pride in our <laughs> house in terms of like being cool or look, you know, it's like you just do stupid stuff to make the other one laugh. My kids are weird, thank God. Um, I'm weird, but like when I read a script, I think when you just go like, Oh, God. And when I'm a little bit embarrassed and also like, oh, I wish she didn't do that. <laughs> Even though I'm like, I kind of love that she felt that. Like, when there's something where you're kind of laughing and also going like, oh, I hope she's okay. <laughs> and like, I shouldn't be laughing. Like, something about that nervousness or just when someone is so like, 
I think when people are the butt of the jokes, I like to be the butt of the jokes. I think it's way too easy to be real smart and like make fun of people. It's not my thing, but when someone's when someone's willing to be the butt of a joke and take the fall or take the stupid comment or I don't know, to me that really hits a sweet spot in me. Interesting. So I've been thinking a lot about your work. You've written, you've directed TV, you've produced. What's your favorite thing to do in the creative space? Or do you not have a favorite? All of it. I think it's the sum of all the parts. I think I think it goes back to the worker bee. I need to physically do stuff. And I love the thought of you can get together with a group of people and for a play, for for anything, for like a art project, anything you're doing, and you're like, if you do this, and it's always kind of our gang. I'm like, if you bring this and I bring that, together we got a macaroni salad. Like, <laughs> I love the thought of just that you can come together in a group and kind of make this thing better. And then if you have this idea and then someone tops it, you're like, oh my God. Like, I'm always amazed with a great idea and then that idea makes someone else think of that. I love the one upping. Like, I'm never into like, that's it, we've hit it. Don't change a thing. I'm always like, keep it coming. So I, lo I love watching other people act and directing them. I love the thought of like, someone comes in with like a crazy score for a scene that you thought was good, but now you put music to it and you're like, oh my God, like, what did you do? It's so good. And I just, I think I just love to watch people fully do what they do and do it so well and then when you're all willing to kind of work together I think it just keeps it just keeps elevating that excellent well I don't want to take up the entire evening with my questions which I could we would love to open it up to the audience but please make sure you have a question and not a comment which you can save for your blog <laughs> I've been here before <laughs> I, I recognize some of you. <laughs> so there are ushers. Just raise your hand and an usher will bring you a microphone. And get a great workout doing it. Amen. Look at him go. So young. <laughs> Hi. I thought that this was a unique movie on a lot of levels, but especially in the fact that it was in... It was a story about a lesbian woman where this centerpiece wasn't the fact that she was a lesbian. Were you aware of that as you were playing her? I certainly hope so. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's part of what I loved about it. I, I don't think that someone's sexuality is the only thing that they are. I think it's a part and parcel of one of the many great interesting things about people. And so I love that this story, it was such a part of who they were, and yet it was not the totality of who they were, because I think that's so much truer to life. And I love that it was a part of their story and a really valid part, but I think it can't always just be like, and they're gay. Because <laughs> I think, yes, and a writer and and caustic and this and fascinating and funny and blah 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 it's it's there's so many puzzle pieces that make someone this like fantastic image that I, I like that it was part of it I think that's a good when we stop being so I think fascinated with that's the first thing that comes up it's a great thing but it doesn't have to be the only topic in a person, then it becomes more of like, you're not so shocked by it. And people that think like, oh, if they can't get past that, I'm like, oh my God, there's, there's 35 amazing things about any given person. Like, let's bring them all in and tell their whole story. This is a story about all of Lee. And I loved it for that. Excellent. There are questions up there. Oh, and up there. I haven't read any of her works because, like you, I hadn't heard of her before tonight. Um, but since you have read them, how do her nonfiction works compare to her memoir? 
Did, did she have a different voice? Well, she, I mean, I think it's even in, in the film, which she, she's an excellent writer, but she does not highlight herself. She doesn't put herself into it and put her perspective. She really just shines the light on her subject, and she did it really, really well. But I think her ability to write um, great biographies and then to hear Lee's real voice and that wit come through were very different things. But she wasn't, you know, she wasn't trying to be known for herself. She just thought, I mean, she even says it, my, my job is to, to write about the other person. So some of that incredible wit and those, I mean, she can turn a line like nobody else. And uh, that, that wasn't always in them, although they were really well done. Wonderfully played. I really enjoyed your, you. your work. Thanks. One of the things that struck me uh, as a physician, I'm just looking, and the, the, I don't care that people were cheated about these, um, about these, these letters. They were well written. <laughs> but what I suffer is that Nobody was there to lend a hand to this woman or the, the, the guy to help them because they needed support. And I think that, to me, is the big thing about this story is that these are very capable people. They have a lot of potential, but the, something crippling in New York has hurt them because... The fact that she's gay is irrelevant. Uh, she's very articulate, and yet she can't function. So, but she has, to me, a need for help, and New York isn't helping her. That's no, and I, I think I mean to me that was that was maybe the biggest thing that drew me to it was the the love story between Jack and Lee, and as much as she isolated herself. Um, because she just couldn't change her way. She couldn't go with the flow. She couldn't just change who she was. And I loved her for that, even though I think it did not make her life easier. And Jack had isolated him in a way by being exactly who he was. And again, not being able to make kind of long-lasting relationships. And I, to me, it's why they both found each other. I mean, two people that on the surface seemed to be perfectly fine being like, all I need is myself, I get by on my own, this. At some point, as a human being, you need someone to see you, to really look at you, bumps and bruises and flaws and all the good and bad, and to say, I really see you and it's okay. And I think that's why those two people in my heart came together because they were at a point where they were so lonely. I mean, it's a... It's a story of loneliness and isolation in New York City that I think, especially if you've lived there, but any anybody has had that feeling. And at some point, you need to come together. And I, to me, that's, I've done, you know, a number of these, and that seems to be the common tether to people watching it, that we have all felt that. And you watch these two people come together, and you know that even when it's that bad, you can... If you put yourself out there a little bit, you can find someone. And there's there's quite a bit of hope in that. To me. Other questions? Hi there. Hi. I was just wondering, um, oh, hi. I was just wondering, uh, good job, guys. And I was wondering if you could tell me if you're, when you're focused on the part, whether authenticity was more important than your experience as an actor in this, or vice versa? Thanks. Um, I think for me, I was always thinking about what would Lee, what would Lee think about this? How am, I, how am I doing to her? I want to do right by Lee. And um, you know, she wasn't around, and I could only look to the people that knew her and I did know, uh, met someone at Julius's one day. We were there for a few days shooting, which is where she hung out. 
um, often at the bar with headphones. And the bartender said, unless she was in the mood to hold court, and then she'd move over to the barrel table and hold court until she didn't want to talk to anybody anymore. And uh, somebody was just watching all day, and I didn't know who he was with. I was like, is he someone's friend, or is he part of the, no, he's not part of the crew. And uh, at one point, about halfway through the day, I was walking by him, and I just introduced myself to him and asked who he was. And he said, it's hard for me not to come and sit down next to you. I was like, oh, OK. And he said, that was my job. I sat to Lee's left. And I was like, oh, OK. And I said, how am I, you know, I, that's all I could say was, how am I doing OK? And would she like this? And he, he kind of seemed a little shaken and took a deep breath and then went, well, he wouldn't really like anything. <laughs> Which, again, every Lee story ends like that. I think I actually said, but she'd be happy. And he said, happy wasn't Lee's thing. He goes, but she would love the attention on her work. She would, she would like that this film is about her work and that was good. And even the work that she got in trouble for, she knew it was good, and we were still shooting it that way. And he goes, that would mean a lot to her. And that's kind of what I, and I knew she didn't want it to be, um, she didn't want to see, she didn't want sympathy, which is the, the two producers that knew her. She said, don't make me pathetic and keep the writing good. And I, I think Mari and everybody that worked on this so hard, I think, I feel like we've done that, and that was that was the big driving force for for me. What in this role did you find particularly difficult, and what did you find easy? I found. Uh, I mean, she, she Lee has a very different energy from myself. I kind of, I go out probably too much. And I found her kind of armadillo, you know, ways very interesting to me. I, th I think just learn, kind of getting her cadence was tricky, but I liked it. Um, I think really difficult, I think when Jack, who was played so incredibly well by Richard E. Grant, um, just remarkable, I think. I think when he, toward the end, when he, um, clearly is ill and he's losing his battle to AIDS which was such a huge um, you know kind of disaster happening in New York City at that time I think that was really hard to play though that was our last our last day on set and we had a we had a very tough time getting through that just because I had grown so fond of Richard and of Jack, so it's like on both ends, I, I had a hard time doing it, but uh, I think he did it beautifully. And uh, I don't know, I loved her her lack of, I think it was very fun, because I've, I've played so many women who are energetically verbal, which I enjoy quite a bit. And uh, Lee, as verbal and smart and witty as she was, I always thought she just kind of laid in wait. <laughs> and a lot of times it was like, if I just ignore them enough, they'll go away. So her <laughs> waiting it out, knowing she could crush them, but would choose sometimes to just ignore, I thought, I thought, oh, that's, it's the fun of playing someone so, you know, every, everybody has their own defense mechanisms, and her, mine and Lee's are, are different, so getting to play someone so the opposite was, uh, was really uh, fun. Excellent. We have time for one last question. Oh, all right. Yeah, just if you could play anybody else, thinking this is your first maybe biography role in history, who would you want to have played? Oh my God, that's like asking your favorite album. <laughs> Um, oh my God. So many people that I couldn't because I don't look anything in, in the world like them. Um, you know, I was like, Patti Smith, I'm not getting that part. <laughs> uh, it, 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 truly, that's like the first, per um, I don't know. So many men and women come to my mind. I think that really is like your favorite book or album. I'm like, oh, I don't know. That's going to change by the hour. <laughs> I'll think on that one though. That's a good one. 
Excellent. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Whoa, that's festive. Wow, guys. <laughs> and thank Melissa McCarthy for joining us this evening. Thanks for that. <laughs>